Did you know that almost one in three kids from the ages 13 to 18 experience an anxiety disorder? Over the last two decades, anxiety disorders in teens and children have risen by almost 20%. Why is that? Hello, my name is Georgia Carter, and for my master's topic, I explored what anxiety is, why we experience it, and why there's been a rise of it in teens. In my presentation, I will cover what anxiety looks like in our bodies and brain and connecting other illnesses to it. I will then talk about the factors that contribute to anxiety, like genetics, and importantly, teens' use of social media. I want to leave you with some strategies, so I will end by talking about coping mechanisms and techniques to help with anxiety, such as sleeping, eating, mindfulness, and therapies. When I first heard of anxiety, I thought only some people suffered from it, and that it was always a hard thing to go through. In reality, anxiety is a normal thing that everyone experiences to different degrees. Anxiety is when you feel nervous or anxious before, before doing something challenging, such as right now. It is the feeling we get when our gut instincts take over and help influence our decisions. Anxiety in moderation is healthy. It helps motivate you to do things like getting up for school because you don't want to miss the bus, or nervousness before an upcoming test that pushes you to study. However, experiencing a lot of anxiety for multiple weeks and months could negatively affect your daily routine and could result in an anxiety disorder. The brain is an interesting and complicated part of your body. The frontal cortex are where decisions are made. The inner part of the brain stores the amygdala, which is the control center for fear and anxiety. It gives the body hormones, like genetics, or like adrenaline when it senses threat. It also prepares us to fight or flee, which helps us keep ourselves alive by reacting to stimulus that could feed a potential threat. You can think of your brain as a hand with your thumb as the amygdala and your finger describing it as the frontal cortex. When you're anxious, your amygdala is activated and you essentially flip your lip. You are in fight or flight mode. Only when you feel calm does your frontal cortex take over and you can make a decision without a strong emotional influence. For example, if you were to hear a loud noise behind you, your amygdala would take over and you would flip your lid. Only when you look behind and find that it was only your cat would you be calm, en would you be calm enough to let your frontal cortex make a decision not to run. Our brains are divided into two parts, the, cogn the cognitive brain and the emotional brain. In the cognitive brain, it controls skills like how to think, learn, read, remember, reason, and pay attention. The emotional part of the brain can be represented by the movie Inside Out. That movie did a perfect representation of the emotional side, side since it showed emotions like joy, sadness, disgust, and anger. When the emotional side of the brain overpowers the cognitive side, we can feel anxiety. when someone has anxiety? Well, your body goes through four actions. First, adrenal glands secrete the stress hormone cortisol. Too much cortisol can, makes, the memory makes the memory of trauma fragmented and hard to organize. Then, a racing heartbeat. The sympathetic nervous system reacts. Heart rate and breathing increase or rise beyond normal. Breathing can become so intense that a person hyperventilates. Essentially, this is preparing your body to fight or run away. Third, fight, fright, or flight. Your senses become hyper alert. Sight, sound, smell, and touch are looking for potential new threats. And last, digestion shutdown. The brain shifts its focus from normal functions or pleasure to detecting danger. Sometimes the body even vomits to stop digestion. <coughs> there are also symptoms of anxiety that could indicate that you have the disorder. But having or not having some of these symptoms doesn't determine whether you have the diagnosis. Panic attacks, trouble concentrating and sleeping, avoiding triggers, reliving trauma, and, or repetition of a, specific, of a specific behavior are all examples of anxiety symptoms. Neurotransmitters and hormones are two types of chemical signals in our bodies. Some of these chemicals are linked to anxiety. 
Dopamine is a neurotransmitter that our nervous system uses to send messages between nerve cells. Having too much or too little dopamine in different parts of the brain can be linked to several mental health disorders and challenges, including anxiety. Adrenaline is a hormone released when you feel anxiety. It is used to make your body react faster. Cortisol is a stress hormone that fuels your fight or flight system and can alter or shut down functions, like digestion, that get in the way when your body is in high alert. Serotonin is a hormone that is responsible for your moods and feelings, since it can help reduce your, your, since it can help reduce your depression and regulate your anxiety. It also helps in sleeping, eating, and digestion, and enables cells to communicate. As I said before, everyone experiences anxiety to a certain degree. However, every, not everyone has an anxiety disorder. To have an anxiety disorder, there are certain characteristics or symptoms. Number one, worries that someone is having which don't match the actual threat. Number two, fear continuing over a long period of time, at least several months. Number three, often other physical symptoms are shown. And finally, number four, anxiety is hard or impossible to control and affects other abilities and affects your ability to live your life. Having an anxiety disorder is common. Many people suffer from it. In fact, it is the most common mental illness in Canada. There are many different anxiety disorders, all with different symptoms. Social anxiety is a very common disorder that teenagers experience. It is when you fear being judged and embarrassed in social settings. Imagine being too nervous to order your own food at a restaurant. That's an example of a situation with social anxiety. Another type is specific phobia. This type of anxiety disorder is when you are scared of or have a heightened fear with a specific object, activity, or situation. There are factors in our environment that can influence our mental health. Some of these factors we can control and some of them are predetermined and out of our hands. One part of anxiety that you can control is your genetic makeup. The risk of you having an, or one part of your anxiety that you cannot control is your genetic makeup. The risk of you having an anxiety disorder is higher if these types of disorders run in your family. Some disorders are even understood at a genetic level. For example, the presence of the RBFOX1 gene gives you a higher chance of developing generalized anxiety. Certain personality traits can also increase your chance of having an anxiety disorder. Traits like perfectionism, overthinking, avoidance, and resistance, and resistance to change can, if overly expressed, lead to an anxiety disorder. Statistics also support that there are some groups of people that can experience anxiety more often. Women are twice as likely to be, to be diagnosed with anxiety because of hormonal changes and caregiving stress. Teens are also affected by anxiety more often because of their origin in social environments, which can also cause social phobias and panic disorders. Because teens suffer more from anxiety, it's important to look at the factors in their lives that put more pressure on them. The good thing is, is that some of these pressures are by choice and there are ways to control them. Although you can't control all factors contributing to anxiety, there are some we can. Social media and access to smartphones have changed how teens live. This has added another platform that can increase stress and contribute to anxiety. Social media can intensify negative feelings of body image, addiction to likes and followers, and it opens up a new outlet for bullies, cyberbullying. On top of this, there's an increase of stresses at school and home. This generation has a new challenge that other generations in the past have not had to struggle with. Personal cell phones and easy access to the internet have grown exponentially. Put your hand up if you have a phone. Keep your hand up if you regularly check your phone every hour, at least when you're allowed to. In the past 15 years, many digital platforms have been developed that give any user a broad audience and also many perspectives on other people's lives. This can be positive, as it connects people, especially during this time of separation. But there are negative impacts as well. 
The negative side effects can be linked to an increase in anxiety. Have you ever been scrolling through Instagram and started comparing yourself, your body, your lifestyle to the people on the screen? If you have, then you are not alone. A summary of 20 research papers proved that people think negative thoughts about their body when scrolling through Instagram. This is because it is extremely uncommon for people to post themselves in an unattractive way or seeming vulnerable, which paints a picture of a perfect life, even though it's just a small part of theirs and masks imperfection. On Instagram, there is a category called Fitspiration. Posts are specifically good at making people compare themselves to others. According to a BBC article on how social media affects body image, research suggests that Fitspiration images are in particular, which typically feature beautiful people doing exercises, or at least pretending to, might make you harsher on yourself. Despite the fact that bodies portrayed on social media are sometimes modified to look perfect and portray hard to achieve and maintain figures, people still commonly compare themselves to others. This, this is part of the reason why body dissatisfaction is present within 90% of women. On the flip side, there are body positive Instagram categories that research has shown boosted young women's self-confidence with body satisfaction. All of this shows that social media can increase anxiety because you can compare yourself to others on an unrealistic platform. The criteria for social media addiction is thinking about social networking excessively, such as concern over it, uncontrollable urges to use social media, and using it so much that it affects other important life aspects. A quote by Sharon Selby, a local youth counselor says, teens connect their self-worth with likes on social media. This is a superficial way to judge your own popularity. In fact, our brain chemistry can be changed with too much social media to desire likes, retweets, and tags. The addiction to the response you get on social media communicates with the reward circuitry part of the brain, the same part that would react to chocolate and gambling if that was your addiction. For example, getting a like on your posts on Instagram gives your brain a hit of dopamine, which is like a reward or pleasure. Harvard researcher Trevor Haynes says, dopamine is associated with food, exercise, love, sex, gambling, drugs, and now social media. This addiction can contribute to anxiety and that people constantly want the likes and would react poorly to not getting them. Having a phone that is constantly notifying you when you do and do not receive a like is a reward that a teenager can become addicted to. However, not receiving likes also contributes to anxiety. Luckily, research has shown that by limiting the amount of time you spend on social media, it can reduce harmful psychological effects. A study proved that a limited amount of social media, of, screen, of 30 minutes of screen time a day, mom and dad, please do not take this here literally, decreases feelings of depression and loneliness. So by monitoring your amount of screen time, you could improve your mood and help stop an addiction. This new technology has opened up a new platform for bullying. Social media allows people to be more connected through their smartphones and computers, but has inadvertently made it also a platform for bullying. Cyberbullying is humiliating or threatening somebody using social media, websites, or messages. It's not as intimidating to insult people to their face. That is why social media gets used for bullying, because it's all done over a screen and you don't see a reaction, but it hurts the victim just as much. When bullying occurs face to face, the victim can leave and remove themselves from the situation. When cyberbullying occurs, it follows the victim around everywhere, constantly, almost as if they have no escape. Cyberbullying can commonly lead to target suffering from depression and low self-esteem. In the last decade, pressures on students have risen from grades intensifying and universities getting more competitive. Many teachers say that stress levels are increasing and school pressure is having a negative effect on their mental health. A 2014 study by the American Psychological Association found that U.S. teens are even more stressed out than adults. 30% of teens reported feeling sad or depressed because of stress, and 31% felt overwhelmed. The stress of school can, tra can transfer into your family life. The expectations of your parents that you will be going to college or university gets put on you. This not only affects your mental health, 
but also your relationship with your family. This can create tension and a guilty relationship that is meant to be supportive. When I had an interview with Sharon Selby, a clinical counselor at the Able Clinic in West Vancouver, I learned that kids these days have become more sensitive. Part of this reason is because sensitive people would be more attracted to other sensitive people and they would have more sensitive kids. So it's just genetics and evolution. Another aspect of, that, of this is that parents are protecting their kids too much from any stress or anxiety. Some parents don't want their children to fail or feel stressed, so they bubble wrap them and protect them from difficult experiences. This leads to kids not able to cope with stress as they have not had any experience with this. Unfortunately, this has led to a higher number of dropouts at university and college because they don't have the skills to manage stress and anxiety when the bubble wrap comes off. Now, for the good news. There are many ways to prevent and lower your chances of developing anxiety. By taking care of your physical health, such as eating well and practicing good sleep hygiene, anxiety levels can reduce. Finding ways to take care of your mental health, such as eating, such as practicing mindfulness, girding and breathing exercises, and using strategies like cognitive behavior therapy can also reduce your anxiety levels. Many studies have shown that anxiety and sleep problems are connected in multiple ways and can have positive and negative effects on each other. Clearly, a lack of sleep can impact anyone's anxiety levels, but anxiety can also impact how you sleep. According to ADD.org, anxiety causes sleep problems, and new research suggests that sleep deprivation can cause an anxiety disorder. Although most people love sleep, many don't get enough. This is especially true for teenagers. The National Sleep Foundation recommends that teenagers, 14 to 17 years old, should get 8 to 10 hours of sleep per night. I know I don't get that much sleep per night. How about you? <laughs> it has also been shown that insufficient sleep can increase anxiety, showing the effects sleep and anxiety have on one another. Eating properly is a big contributor to your, to your physical health, but also to your mental health. There is a whole body of research on the food-mood connection. By eating a nutritious meal, you can have a better mood and higher energy. Mental health first aid said, in recent years, evidence shows that food can contribute to the development prevention, and management of mental health conditions, including depression and anxiety disorders. Although food isn't always thought of as being an important contributor to your mental health, it is and should be thought of as a fuel to run your body and your mind. Exercise is a crucial part of helping your mental health. Not only can it reduce stress, but it, also, but it has also been linked to helping anxiety and depression. With a minimum of five minutes of exercise a day, you can improve your mental health. ADD.org says that studies show that it is very effective at reducing fatigue, improving alertness and concentration, and at enhancing overall cognitive function. Exercise also creates endorphins, which helps you sleep, which then can also help you reduce your anxiety. Mindfulness is a simple but effective way to help improve and reduce your anxiety. A study summarizing 39 studies proved that mindfulness-based therapy reduces anxiety. Mindfulness is the process of looking at the present in a non-judgmental way. It enables us to distance ourselves from our thoughts and feelings without labeling them as good or bad. By using and practicing mindfulness, you can learn more about your emotions and look at them from a different point of view. It can also help you be more focused in your daily life and help you lower your blood pressure. Some effective ways to practice, mindfulness, to practice mindfulness are using apps like Headspace or other programs that could help you meditate. Some other activities that can help you practice mindfulness are coloring, yoga, deep breathing, and connecting with nature. In summary, mindfulness is an easy and effective way to improve your level of anxiety and has other benefits along with practicing it. Cognitive behavior therapy is a clinical treatment that is very effective and one of the most helpful methods to manage anxiety. CBT has a main set of principles. One principle of CBT is focusing on what is occurring in the present instead of focusing on what the causes are in the past or what might happen in the future. For instance, maybe you're scared of elevators because you got stuck in one and it was a traumatizing experience. 
Although knowing where the trigger is coming from can be helpful, it's not going to cure your elevator anxiety. By adding CBT strategies into your daily routine, you can practice techniques and apply, and apply them to situations in real life. This helps your brain make different thinking patterns. CBT is a collaborative therapy. This is because you and your therapist are working together to help improve and manage your anxiety. In cognitive behavioral therapy, the therapist is teaching the patient how to become their own therapist. Essentially, if you change the patterns, you can change how you feel about your experiences. There are many common and effective, and effective practices used in CBT. One example is implementing different types of exposure to a trigger. Exposure may be used to help obsessive compulsive disorders, nightmares, and anxiety by gradually exposing yourself to triggers. For example, if going to a crowded place causes anxiety, you might start by looking at pictures and videos of crowds, then standing outside of a crowded place, and eventually working towards being inside. This, this idea is to do it in small enough steps that each step can be successful. There are many other practices commonly used by therapists during CBT. Journaling helps with organizing the patterns of your thoughts and emotional tendencies and how to cope with them. Relaxed breathing brings regularity and calmness to your breathing, which then translates to a calmer mind. Play the script until the end is a method that makes you think what would happen in the worst case scenario? This helps you recognize that the worst case scenario ending is still manageable. I started researching anxiety in teens a year ago and I learned so much. I believed that anxiety in teens was a big problem and my thought was proven to be true. Social media is a whole new platform that teens interact on. With the, with the positives comes negatives, like addiction, cyberbullying, and a constant comparison to others. All of these examples have been proven, have been proven to contribute to, to teen anxiety. The good, thing is, as a, the good thing is, there are many psychologists and counselors to help people learn how to cope with this increased anxiety. Even if you don't have the resources for a counselor or a psychologist, there are strategies that anyone can practice to keep them in a healthy mindset. Sleeping, eating, exercise, and mindfulness are factors that you can control to help lower your anxiety levels. If your anxiety becomes too much to handle, counselors can help by guiding you through cognitive behavior therapy. These are scientifically proven techniques to reduce anxiety and unhealthy thinking patterns. This past year of researching anxiety has helped me better, to better understand how I should handle my own stress and anxiety in a situation. My next goal was to help other people who struggle from this. I am definitely not a counselor or psychologist, but I feel better equipped to handle anxiety in myself and others. Furthermore, I hope you, my audience, have also increased your awareness of anxiety, the causes of it, and what you can do to reduce anxiety in your life. I would like to thank my two advisors. I was lucky enough to get two amazing advisors who supported me throughout this whole project. Jennifer Henriksen, my faculty advisor, and Angie McClellan, my external advisor. Thank you so, so much. I wouldn't have been able to have, done, to have done this project without you. I would also like to thank my parents for helping me edit and making me practice my presentation in front of them, as well as Sharon Selby, who made time on her schedule for me to interview her. Lastly, I would like to thank you for listening to my presentation. Um, and so before I ask my question, which I wrote down, I just want to say um, this, I'm so glad that you chose this topic because there's so much misunderstanding and lack of understanding around mental health, especially when it comes to disorders like anxiety and depression. And the way that's going to change is from people talking more about it. So <coughs> you're taking this on and educating yourself and then educating everyone else here. So your peers and your parents and your teachers, those are the things that are going to change how people perceive it. It's going to increase awareness. It's going to decrease stigma. It's going to make it safer for people who are struggling, feel like they can come out and seek out help. So, so thank you for doing that. I think it's really important. So my question, which I had to write down because I wanted to make sure I remembered it further to what I just said. So from your research, what would you say are some top things people, uh, you'd like people to know about anxiety disorders so that they are in a better position to help um, people who are struggling with it? Um, 
probably that it's a common thing, so you can talk to people about it, and I think bringing awareness to it is very important so that people actually know stuff about it, and as well as some of the techniques to lower anxiety, especially CBT. The CBD is, CBT is very good at reducing anxiety, especially in anxiety disorders. So I just think talking about it and then giving, like spreading information about it. Can I ask one more question about that? Do you feel like in your, among your peers, do you feel like it's a safe place for each of you to talk about mental illness and mental health and how you're feeling? Or do you feel like there's still a ways to go? I think it's not like a daily conversation, but I think you can definitely, I would hope you could probably talk to some of your peers about it. Like I probably would go up to like a random kid in my class and go, I'm really sad right now, but like, I could probably, I could talk to one of my friends about it, and I think most of the other kids in my class could probably do that too. Great presentation, Ms. Carter. Um, I was just wondering, I don't know if you found this in your research or anything, about your opinion on taking the medications for anxiety and depression, and how that would make you feel better, and how that would help with the anxiety and depression. I didn't do a lot of research on medication and anxiety, but there's definitely those resources and those options. I would probably recommend that you try like not natural but I guess more natural or less like I'd probably say try other techniques like eating well and getting good sleep and then like try CBT or something like that instead of going straight to medications but medications can also be really helpful.